Okay, welcome to the next part of the class on variational methods. Last time we left off uh, with the Euler-Lagrange equation as the extremality principle. And so I want to recap a little bit how we came to this Euler-Lagrange equation because the Euler-Lagrange equation can be considered as one of the core elements of variational methods. The idea, as you remember, of variational methods is that we minimize energies over some space of solutions U uh, by, uh, by an extremality principle by saying we want configurations U optimal such that dE by dU equals zero. And this extremality principle, if E is a functional, meaning a mapping that assigns a, to a function U some, uh, some value, some cost, uh, then this uh, equation is called the Euler-Lagrange equation. And so this is the key kind of extremality principle that we aim to resolve. So let's look a little bit at how we derived it. <coughs> Uh, we started with uh, this directional derivative of, uh, La of uh, Gateau, 1914, published in 1919, uh, 19 actually, so a fairly old way. Uh, uh, this is one possibility, I said, to tackle this uh, problem. And as you can see, it defines derivatives in some direction h. And to remind you, the idea was that we perturb an initial function u by adding another function h to it, and we scale that added function by epsilon. And then if we let epsilon go to zero, we get and, and divide this difference here by epsilon, we get this idea of the derivative. How does the function e, how does the energy change if we perturb u very infinitesimally? And the whole difference to standard uh, analysis in, in, say, one or more dimensions is that here we have infinitely many dimensions. Because the function u that we have can be perturbed in infinitely many dimensions, degrees of freedom. And so all of these degrees of freedom, we call them h here, and the directional derivative can then be represented as the functional gradient dE by dU projected onto h. And so what we do now is we take this derivative definition and plug in this what we call canonical form of functionals. Functionals which have the form that they evaluate the cost of u by basically a summation or integral over all pixels and then some local cost that may depend in this case on the function value itself and on its derivative. And in general, of course, I said it could be depending on higher order derivatives, second derivative, etc. But for now, let's consider this case of u and u prime. If we plug that into this definition of the directional derivative, uh, then we get these two terms here, L at uh, the perturbed uh, location, so to speak, U plus epsilon H, and U prime plus epsilon H prime, minus L at the original location, at the original function U, where we do the perturbation. And then, since we want to consider small perturbations, the natural thing to do is to use a Taylor expansion here to consider small offsets epsilon h. Here is the offset. You have the Taylor expansion here in the two arguments, in the first argument and in the second argument. This is a first order Taylor expansion since epsilon goes to zero. In our case, this is sufficient. So we have terms of order epsilon square that we neglect here. The constant term cancels out. And all we and then if we take the limit epsilon going to zero, second order terms vanish, and what is left with what we're left with is these two terms. And then I said we want this to be a, um, a projection onto the function h, and so this is already something projected onto h. This here is not yet because we have h prime, but what we can do is we can do integration by parts, and so. The, we get h here and the derivative of this second term. 
And then we can pull out the h, and what we are left with is h times this thing in the brackets. And as I said, the directional derivative in direction h is nothing but the functional gradient projected onto h. And so, in, so in other words, we can read out from this derivation that this is actually the functional gradient. So this expression here is dE by du for functionals, of course, of this type what we call canonical type. And now the idea is that at the extremum, the derivatives must be zero. The change of E in any direction must vanish locally at the minimum, of course also at the maximum. So this is only a necessary condition for optimality, it's not a sufficient condition in general. So here, for example, of course, the derivative is also zero at other local minima, it's also zero at maxima, and of course you could have saddle points where derivative is also zero. The key here, though, is to say in more dimensions and in infinite dimensions, this derivative must be zero for any choice of h. So no matter what perturbation I add to it, infinitesimally, the energy should not change. And that means that this whole integral must be zero no matter how I choose h. And it turns out you can only get this to be zero for any choice of h if the expression in the brackets itself is zero. To see that, <coughs> We have here integral dE by du times h dx, and that must be zero for all h. Now if you choose h of x in particular as delta of x minus a for any value a, the delta distribution, then what you get here is dE by du at the location a. And so you can say this must be zero for locations A, and in fact you can do that for any for all A. And so what you can get, what you read off, is that this must indeed be zero for all A because I'm allowed to choose functions of this type if I want. Functions of this type mean I add a perturbation really in one location only, and I do a little change in that one location. And so you can read off that this expression in the brackets must be zero, and this is what I've written here, and this is in fact the extremality principle for functionals. And it's called the Euler-Lagrange equation, so this is a key component in variational methods. Let's look at what this equation is. It's not one single scalar equation, it's a functional equation. It's, so it's an equation that depends on a function u, so this is an equation for any x, if x is our variable, and it's, it's actually a differential equation. Why? Because we get derivatives in here. So the Euler-Lagrange equation is a differential equation, and this is again the key uh, idea why variational methods go hand in hand with differential equations. Because this extremality principle that says we want the minimizer, i.e. the location where the energy doesn't change infinitesimally, that condition, it shouldn't change infinitesimally for functionals, is a differential equation. To give you a specific example, we talked about denoising so far. This was kind of the, the motivating example for variational methods. Here is the L, this Lagrangian for the denoising case. It's just the data term u minus f squared plus lambda over 2 times the smoothness term, which is just the derivative of u squared, the norm of the derivative squared. And now we can basically, and this is the nice thing about variational calculus, is the extremality principle. You can read it off almost directly. It is, you have to do, compute this calculation and set it to zero. If we do that, and what's important here in this calculation is that you treat u and u prime as independent variables. So dL by du means 
how does this depend on the function u? The function u is in here, so we just get u minus f. Again, the one-half that we always had here is chosen to make the equation simpler. Right? Question? Yes, so if you have in your L higher order derivatives, you also have an Euler-Lagrange equation. It's not going to look exactly like that. I'm not sure if I have it on the slides, if we do it in class. In case we don't, maybe I'll do it on the board briefly. If you have L that depends on U, U prime, and say U double prime, the second derivative, right? Um, then you can do the same. Uh, Taylor expansion and what you get is one term from u, one term from u prime and of course you get another term from u2 prime which is dl by du2 prime times epsilon h2 prime. And now take a guess what you have to do to rewrite this term. Anyone have an idea? What we did here is integration by parts to get the derivative of. What do you think we're going to do with this term? D divided by D yes, so this is dh, d, uh, uh, d2h by dx squared. What are we going to do to get rid of the derivatives, the second derivative? For the first derivative, we did integration by parts. How will we get rid of the second derivative of h? Yes? Exactly. So we do two integration by parts, and again we assume that the boundary conditions vanish so that h and, and h prime are zero on the boundary. So if we do integration by parts twice, we, the minus sign changes once, and then, by the second integration by parts, we get another change of the minus sign, so we get this term becomes d squared dx squared of dl by du2 prime times h. And so you get in the Euler-Lagrange equation an additional term, and that is exactly this term here. And so for the second derivative, you will get the same expression, except you will get plus that additional term here. And now, for higher orders, you can do it at home, it's easy. What you have to keep in mind, and this is actually important, is that every higher order derivative, you get another sign change. So you get minus d by dx of this, plus d squared by dx squared, minus, etc. Because every time you do an integration by part, you get a change of signs. And so this is how you do higher order derivatives. I don't think I have it on the slides, but it's actually fairly straightforward to do it for second order derivatives. And third and fourth, etc. And similarly, by the way, this is all for one dimension, one spatial dimension x. You can do the exact same thing for two or three spatial dimensions. And then uh, there are different ways to write it, but if you have two spatial variables, you would have d by dx, dl by dux, the x derivative of u, minus d by dy, dl by du, the y derivative of u. Right. So, so this works exactly the same way uh, that you just have several terms for the for the derivatives. Some people write it more compactly. They will write this as minus nabla of dl by d nabla u. You can also write it that way. So there are different notations. Sometimes, though, these notations are confusing. Because if you then try to actually calculate that, it's not always obvious how to calculate this. There are rules to do calculations, because this is a derivative with respect to a vector directly. There are rules to do that. Honestly, I can never remember all the rules. And so, if, if in doubt, just go component-wise. That way you cannot make a mistake. 
Yes, so let's look at this example. This is the denoising example. If we plug that in here, the derivative of L with respect to U, the first term here, what do we have to do? We check where is the U, it's here. We take the derivative, it's just U minus F. It's linear in U, so because this is quadratic, we get something linear. And then uh, D minus D by DX, times the derivative of this thing by u prime. u prime is here, so we just get lambda u prime. And now, assuming that uh, la lambda was a constant, so lambda did not depend on x, so the x derivative goes right on u prime, and so what we get is u minus f minus lambda u2 prime, the second derivative equals zero, and so this is a differential equation, and the function u that solves this di differential equation is the minimizer of our functional. So this is the Euler-Lagrange equation, which means that one way to solve variational methods is to set up the Euler-Lagrange equation, compute it for your specific choice of functional, and then solve that equation. In general, solving differential equations is not uh, easy. It depends on what differential equations you have. Here we are well off because it's a linear equation. And that is because the functional was quadratic. So much like in the discrete setting, if you choose a quadratic cost function, life is easier. In general, it's somewhat tricky how to do uh, uh, the solve the Euler-Lagrange equation, so the idea is it forms the necessary condition for minimality. We saw that in general this is not a sufficient condition. When is it a sufficient condition? What's an example of functionals? Yes? If they're convex, exactly. So if we have a convex energy, which in fact in this case we have, then uh, it's also a sufficient condition, which means then all we have to do is solve the equation. <coughs> and so the central idea of variational methods is to set up the Euler-Lagrange equation and solve it. How you do that, there are many ways. One way would be that you discretize your function u on a set of pixels or points, so then you have u of xi, and then you can insert that, discretize the equations, and then you, in the last latter case, you would get a linear equation system for the function u at your uh, points x1 through xn. And that you can solve that linear equation system by the algorithms we discussed, by the Jacobi, the Gauss-Seidel method, etc. In general, however, the equations are not linear. And then there is a question of how to solve it, and in fact, in general, it's not actually solvable. It's very difficult to find solutions to the Euler-Lagrange equations. But there is one strategy that always works in a continuous setting, and that always gives you at least a local minimum. Global minima, how to guarantee global minima, in particular if your cost function is not convex, is difficult. There are classes of non-convex energies where you can still compute provable optima, but uh, there is limitations as to what you can do. But local minima we can compute, and for this there is a technique called the descent methods. And these descent methods actually build up directly, they build up directly on the Euler-Lagrange equation. And on this functional derivative, the question is how we can uh, the idea is that you start with an initial guess in, of the solution and then you iteratively improve that initial guess. In every iteration you change the function u in such a way that the energy decreases. And so the intuition is something that you all know, is that you start somewhere u1, let's say, that has some initial cost, and then you perturb u and check in which direction does the energy decrease. And then you just walk in the direction in which the energy decreases until it doesn't decrease any further. And then, of course, you're at the minimum. 
I say that always works. Of course, if you have nasty energies, for example, an energy that exponentially decays like that, you can walk forever. You're not going to finish because the energy keeps going down the further you go. But essentially, the problem here is that this doesn't have a minimum. Or more specifically, the minimum is at infinity, which is almost the same. So these methods are descent methods, and the key question is, once I initialize somewhere with u0, how do I perturb, which direction do I go to make it descend? To make to go downhill, and in fact, this is what the functional gradient tells us. It actually tells us where does it go downhill. Something that you probably remember from finite dimensional analysis. Uh, so I will start with that. Often I go to the discrete setting, to the finite dimensional setting, because there things are still familiar. So let's consider some function on R n mapping to R. And the only difference in the, in the variational calculus we consider later is that we will consider spaces that are not finite dimensional. But the ideas are exactly the same. You have multiple directions. For example, this is a plot with two degrees of freedom, two dimensions, and then you can go in two directions. And the gradient df by du, if u is your argument, so we have a function f of u, df by du in a vector valued setting is a vector that points in the direction of steepest ascent. So uh, that points in the direction where, where it goes uphill. And of course, consequently, minus df by du is a vector pointing in the direction of steepest descent. And so all I have to do, and this is called the gradient descent or steepest descent, is I initialize u at time 0 with a, a value u0. And then over time, I perturb u and say du by dt is minus df by du. So change the function u in time infinitesimally by going in the direction of the negative gradient of your function f. And so in one dimension, here's some examples. Uh, you initialize somewhere and step by step you go downhill. And what you see, this is actually characteristic for gradient descents. Once you discretize them, discretization means this differential equation. We will implement it numerically by saying du by dt, we rewrite du by dt in this equation, we just write it as u at iteration k plus 1 minus u at iteration k divided by tau. Sorry, epsilon is what I took here. Sometimes I call it tau, sometimes epsilon. And then if you, re if you plug that in here and rearrange terms solve for u k plus 1, so this is a simple forward difference discretization of the time derivative, then you get uk plus 1 is nothing but the old function value of u minus an epsilon times that vector that points in the direction of descent. So minus epsilon times df by du. And what you see actually in this discretization of the gradient descent, and this is actually one of the issues with the gradient descent in practice, it gets you downhill, yes, if you take sufficiently small epsilon, that is. If in the discretization your epsilon is too large, what's going to happen is you start here, and then the vector in the steepest descent would point this way, and if you take epsilon too large, you might go here, and so then you actually don't get a lower but a higher energy. And so in this example, you see nicely, I have to choose the step size so it doesn't overstep the minimum. But the, the idea is if epsilon is sufficiently small, then it works. Question is, what is sufficiently small? And in practice, that is an almost endless question. There are many strategies. Here, for example, you see with some choice of epsilon, what happens is at the maximum, the derivative is actually zero. So if you start at the maximum, that vector is zero. It's not going anywhere. And so no matter how large you choose epsilon, it's going to just stay there. 
And so this example, of course, they're not starting at the maximum, but slightly to the right of the maximum. Then the derivative is not zero, it points you where you're going. It's much like when you want to go downhill in a valley, if you're on the top, it doesn't go downhill, then you're on the top. So you have to first, you know, take a little step in some direction and then, then you know where it goes down. And but what you see is, if in the beginning, the gradient is very small, and so consequently, the steps are very small, meaning the, 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 the iterative descent is very slow. So you want to get to the minimum, but the second thing you want is not just to the minimum, but you want to get there as fast as possible. Because you don't want to wait forever until the algorithm terminates, right? And so the challenge is, can we take larger step sizes? And so indeed, there are tons of techniques of adaptive step sizing, where you start with a big epsilon, and if your energy goes up, you know that was not a good choice. So let's take a smaller epsilon, let's see what that does. And so these are lots of heuristics or strategies to accelerate gradient descent. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Yes, and, and th now that you look at this, uh, you can immediately imagine better strategies. For example, the gradient descent is what's called a first-order strategy because it considers first derivatives. The next better thing might be to consider the second derivative of f. For example, in particular, if you have cost functions like the one on the left here that are quadratic, then taking a second derivative may be very smart. Because it, what you can do is you can fit a parabola to some location, you initialize somewhere, you can fit a parabola there by computing first and second derivative and matching it, and that gives you, and then you go directly to the minimum of that parabola. And if you have a perfect, if your cost function is parabolic, then you've, you're done. If it's not quite parabolic, then you're typically very close to the minimum. And these techniques are called Newton methods, so these are methods that use second derivatives. Um, whether that actually is faster in practice or not is again an endless debate. There are competing communities, the Newton people and the gradient people, and so, you know, it, there's always a back and forth. It always depends also on what computational resources you have. For example, the Newton method is often it takes fewer iterations to converge to the minimum in practice, but each iteration is computationally more involved. And sometimes each iteration is no longer parallelizable. And so with the advent of graphics cards and huge parallelization, nowadays there is more people in favor of first order methods because these can be easily parallelized, whereas the Newton methods are often a bit harder to parallelize. But that may change again, you know. With time, people devise strategies to parallelize even second-order methods, and then, and then they get speed up as well, and, and so there's always a, a back and forth here. But for this class, we will focus on gradient descent and first-order methods, because this is not really a class on numerics, uh, but more on variational methods and computer vision. But so this is the gradient descent for finite dimensions, and now the key idea is that in infinite dimensions you do exactly the same. What does that mean? That means in the infinite dimensional case, what we have to plug in here is the Euler, is the functional gradient. So. Let's do that. It basic, and this is the functional gradient. So for this class of I called canonical functionals, the integral of the Lagrangian over your domain. Uh, um, this is the functional gradient. And so gradient descent simply means evolve you in time in direction of the negative functional gradient. The only difference now is that in the finite dimensional setting, this is a vector in Rn, pointing in the direction of the descent. In the infinite dimensional case, this uh, expression here is a function of x, of the spatial variable. And so these are all functions of x that I add here. <coughs> 
And in fact, what you have here is a differential equation. This is also a differential equation, but it's an ordinary differential equation. Here, this is a partial differential equation. Why? Because I have a derivative in time, and I have a derivative in space. And in fact, this, by the way, for those who were wondering, this is why I use the curly D. I try to keep that consistent in the slides. The curly D I use for partial derivatives. And whenever you see a derivative in time with a curly D, it means the function has more than that variable. Here, for example, you have time and you have space. In the previous case, you just had time. There is no space. Or, actually, to, to show you the relation, here U is a vector. And so the different components are actually the values of u at different look at for different pixels. So and and so this is what the w so the argument x here is in some sense the corresponding to the, to the to the um, labeling of the components of a vector, if you want. Except that here it's a continuous argument; space is continuous. So this is a partial differential equation, and we initialize with some initial function u, u0 of x, at time 0, and so over time we evolve that function u. And so you can really think of it that we start with an initial function u0 of x, arbitrary function, and then that function gets perturbed in all sorts of ways over time, and it changes, it evolves, and this is the equation that, ex that governs that evolution. So time doesn't really have the physical meaning of time. We're not modeling time-dependent processes here, but it's, it's a numerical time parameter, and the idea is that for time going to infinity, I get to the minimum of my functional. Let's look at an example. This is again the denoising example, u minus f squared plus lambda over 2 u prime squared. We can plug the functional gradient in here into the uh, equation for the gradient descent. And we get du by dt is f minus u plus lambda u2 prime. All the derivations I said I, I, we did for one dimensional case, but you can, as I said, do it in the two or three dimensional case. And I mentioned what you get is additional terms d by dy, dl by duy, etc just like I wrote on the board. And so in the general case, if you evaluate that for a more general image, then what you get here is the second derivative in more dimensions, and that's nothing but the Laplacian. Now to see if anyone paid attention in class. Let's ignore the data term for now. So that term that has f minus u is no longer there. So we just have the smoothness term. So the energy that we want to minimize is just this energy, nabla u squared dx. This energy, by the way, has a name. It's called the Dirichlet energy. Question to you. We show, and, and what this shows you is that if I do a gradient descent on this energy, E of u, the gradient descent is du by dt is Laplace u. Right? This is what we have here, Laplace u. Anyone recognize that equation? Yes. It's a diffusion equation. And so this is where we close the loop. This is where the if diffusion reappears in the variational setting. Once we minimize a smoothness energy called the Dirichlet energy, just the quadratic gradient integrated, minimizing this by gradient descent, the gradient descent on the Dirichlet energy is just a linear diffusion. And so now we have a, a more abstract way to introduce diffusion. The diffusion as a time-dependent process is nothing but the gradient descent on a smoothness energy. <laughs>
which actually helps us because if you look at this equation, it's not always obvious with differential equations what are they converging to. Once you have the smoothness energy, you can say it. It's a convex energy, the global minimum is a constant function, and that's exactly what this process will lead you to. And so in that way, the variational calculus helps you, it gets you to a certain level of abstraction, of understanding, what am I doing with these diffusion processes? And so we saw the Gaussian blurring can be done by linear diffusion, and now we see even more abstractly, it all just minimizes the Dirichlet energy. <coughs> Here's examples. So this is if you do gradient descent on this functional, you start with an initial image, and of course what happens is it gets more and more blurred, because the minimizer should be close to the initial image, but it should also be smoother in smooth in terms of this Dirichlet energy. If you just take the smoothness term uh, and do the same gradient descent, you could drop the lambda here, it doesn't really matter, it's just a constant factor anyway, then you get the same evolution, almost the same, you see, the difference is that this is more blurred than the other one. Why? Because with time, this process will actually get to a constant gray value, because it only considers smoothness, whereas this process will become stationary or co uh, with a non-constant image, with a blurred version of F, and how blurred it is will depend on how strong that lambda is. Of course, if you let lambda go to infinity here, you will get the same processes here, because it will mean that the smoothness term overrules the data term. <coughs> one addendum, one add-on, I if we go back to the derivation of the Euler-Lagrange equation, this is something I wanted to mention. In this step, we do integration by parts. And I said, we assume that h is zero on the boundary. The question is, do you always need to or want to assume that? And there are many applications where this is not what you want, where you don't want you to be constant on the boundary. For example, classical cases where actually variational methods were pioneered is, uh, let's say you have a wall here, and let's say you take a bar here, and then you put some weight on the bar maybe one kilogram or whatever weight. And then the question you want to solve is, what is the shape of that bar if I put two or three or four kilograms on it? At some point you know the bar is going to break, but let's assume for now it's still you know, in, in the regime where it doesn't break. So it's going to bend like this. And what are you going to have here? The possible shapes of the bar. Also you know from experiment that typically it's not going to look like that. Right? Well, there may be materials, you know, you never know what they can devise. But in practice, it's not going to look like that for most bars. Uh, but what you know is it's going to be fixed here because this is where the bar is fixed in the wall. But on the other end of your domain, if this is your domain omega here, from say A to B, then you know U at A is fixed, U at B is not fixed because it can vary. And so this is a variational problem where you want to make sure that at this side of the boundary uh, you can, can vary. <coughs> and in that case, h will not be zero on your boundary, not on the whole boundary. Or, you know, the, the more extreme case, if you fix the bar in the middle and put weights on both ends, then of course both ends can vary. And then the middle will be free, possibly. So there's all sorts of optimization problems where sometimes this condition is not what you want. Sometimes you don't want the solution to be fixed at the boundary. In image denoising, for example, of course you want to denoise the whole image. You don't want to, you know, impose that I know the solution at the boundary. I don't. 
I want to denoise the boundary pixels as well. So this is actually a pretty bad uh, boundary condition for denoising images, unless you know the true solution on the boundary, but that would be surprising. So this condition actually is called a Dirichlet boundary condition, a condition where the Basically, it says that your solution, no matter how you perturb it, is fixed at the boundary. And that is the easiest condition because it just means in the integration by parts we have no boundary terms. The better way to solve it, and this is what I wanted to show you here, is what happens if we don't have that assumption. So we were here with this uh, derivation of the Euler-Lagrange equation. We had the h prime, and the challenge was to get the derivative away from h, so that we can put it in this canonical form, a product of something with h. We can, of course, do that. We can do integration by parts. We get minus the derivative of the first term times h, and then we get the boundary condition. The boundary, sorry, the boundary term uh, is dl by du prime, right? Just to recap for those who may not remember the integration by parts, the integration by parts basically says that if I have integral f times h prime dx, it's the same as in minus integral f prime times h dx plus f times h evaluated at the boundary, so if the boundary is a and b, let's say, a and b, then you evaluate f times h. Uh, this means f times h at b minus f times h at a. So this expression is f times h evaluated at b minus f times h evaluated at a. And that is, so if we apply that here, this is the additional term we get that we neglected earlier because we assumed that h was zero at a and b. Now we assume it's no longer zero, so we will want this expression to be zero for any choice of h, including functions h that may be non-zero at the boundary. How do we impose, assure that? First of all, obviously with the same reasoning I gave earlier, you can argue the term in the brackets must be zero. Definitely, because I can always choose these delta functions for h and basically pull out that expression at whatever point you want. And so this expression must be zero. This is the classical Euler-Lagrange equation. That's the first condition. And the second one, rather than saying h is zero on the boundary, we now say this term here must be zero on the boundary. And as you can see, there are two possibilities for this to become zero. Either h itself is zero on the boundary, which would be, in the case of that bar I showed you, would be this point. Here we have h is zero, so this is a Dirichlet boundary condition. But then there is another case, and that is that dl by du prime is zero on the boundary. If that is the case, then I'm fine, then h can vary, and I still have an extremum. And so these are the two boundary conditions. In the case that h itself is zero, it basically means u is fixed on the boundary. And in turn, you can say if u is not fixed on the boundary, meaning h can vary on the boundary, I allow perturbations of the boundary, then at least dl by du prime on the boundary must be zero. <coughs> and this is called the von Neumann boundary condition. So these are the two classical boundary conditions, the Dirichlet and the von Neumann boundary condition. In practice, you can also have mixed boundary conditions. And you can have cases like this one, where you have Dirichlet in some location and von Neumann in the other locations. So these are possible boundary conditions that I thought I should show you, so that at least you've seen it. The other thing I wanted to show you in the end, you already said it yourself, the, diff the gradient descent on the Dirichlet energy up here is a linear diffusion. And more generally, we can now say, let's consider an energy that is slightly generalized. So here we have the Dirichlet energy times g, 
uh, and this is the generalization, that we have a smoothness term, in some sense you can think of an adaptive smoothness, where you, allow, where you impose smoothness of u, the gradient should be small, but depending on how you choose g at different locations in space, you can have more smoothness or less smoothness in certain locations. And so this is the function g that modulates the smoothness requirement in different locations. Maybe there are some constraints that you say, I want the image to be very smooth here, but not smooth elsewhere, or less smooth. You can easily do that by choosing your favorite function g. Let's look at the gradient descent. If we do a gradient descent on this energy, we say du by dt is minus de by du. And that is minus dl by du, and here I wrote it, nabla plus nabla times dl by d nabla u. This nabla, by the way, is then the divergence, actually, because what you get here is a vector. And if you do that, uh, then uh, it doesn't depend on u, so that term is zero. It only depends on nabla u, and what you get is g times nabla u. This is nabla u norm squared. If you take the derivative with respect to nabla u, you just get nabla u itself. And so what we end up with is a generalized diffusion, a, a so-called inhomogeneous diffusion. If you go back to the slides on the diffusion, you remember there's various choices we can take for g. If g is scalar, but depending on space, it's called inhomogeneous because the diffusion can vary from one location to the other. And so G is just the diffusivity, if you remember. And now you see the relation, the diffusivity in the diffusion process is nothing but the weighting in this Dirichlet energy, the local weighting. And of course, it, it makes sense. The diffusivity tells you how much does it diffuse in a location, and the G here tells you how much smoothness do I want. Obviously, this is related. And so, in other words, the inhomogeneous diffusion process is nothing but a gradient descent on the weighted Dirichlet energy. To end, these are, uh, there's many uh, people who developed the theory, the variational calculus, two of the, uh, we saw the Gateau derivative earlier, the two pioneering researchers or two of the most influential mathematicians developing this theory and basically giving the name to the Euler-Lagrange equation were Euler. This is Euler and Lagrange later. Euler is maybe the or definitely one of the most influential mathematicians of all times. He published amazingly many papers, almost a thousand papers. Nowadays, people publish a thousand papers, no problem. But each of these papers is typically short, and typically there may be some Max Planck director with a group of 30 researchers doing papers, and they supervise all of them, and so they're co-author on the papers. With that, today, it's not so difficult to, to generate a thousand papers. But these thousand papers, he actually authored pretty much all by himself. And many of them are extremely influential. And you can still see his influence. It's actually quite amazing how productive he was. Turns out that most of these papers were published in the last 20 years of his life. This is very unusual. Typically, most researchers, especially in the mathematical sciences, do their pioneering works in their early years, up to 30, 40 years. Here it's different. You see he, he became fairly old, at least for his time, unusually old. He had 13 children, lots of grandchildren, and one of the things that is known about him is that he was able to concentrate on his work with all his grandchildren playing around him. Um, and so he published a, a large number of very influential works, and you can still see them. You have seen them in many classes. You know the Euler number, little e. You know the Euler angles, the Euler formula, Euler theorem, Euler equations. There's so much Euler in, in science, it's amazing. In fact, if you say the Euler e formula, you have to ask which one. There's tons of Euler formulas and Euler equations. And for us, importantly, the Euler-Lagrange equation. 
This is Lagrange, another interesting and very influential character in uh, in the mathematics. He actually, despite uh, what the name indicates, is not a French mathematician, but an Italian mathematician, uh, born in Turin. He is self-taught, uh, and for some reason, he, so he had French ancestry, and he liked that so much that he changed his name. So he was born Giuseppe Lodovico Lagrangia, but then he changed his name into Lagrange, Joseph Louis Lagrange, in basically a reverence for his French ancestors. He was a professor for mathematics in Turin and later moved to Berlin and then to Paris as well. He published a number of influential books, in particular La Mécanique Analytique and the second one Leçon sur le Calcul des Fonctions, two books where in particular this Euler-Lagrange calculus is developed. That's all for today. Thank you. <laughs>